Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Thanks for joining me, Jincy. We're here today to talk about your book, Before the Diagnosis. It's an anthology. So can you tell me a little bit about that one? Oh, absolutely. This is the cover. Actually, it's a picture I took down our street one day. And it's called Before the Diagnosis, Stories of Life and Love Before Dementia. And it is an anthology, as you said, of 36 essays. Um, and each one was written by a family member about their loved one and what they were like before their diagnosis of anything under that dementia umbrella. You know, dementia, um, MCI, you know, mild cognitive impairment, Lewy body, uh, frontal temporal, Alzheimer's, you name it, we pretty much covered it. So we have four sections in the book. And part one is essays about mothers and fathers. Part two is husbands and wives. Part three, there was no good way to say everyone else. So <laughs> it is, so I called it extended family. And it's like about a grandfather. Uh, one woman actually lost two children to a childhood dementia type. And so nice. there's, or she lost one child and the other one's actually still alive. So there's two separate essays by her about each of her two children. Um, they're written about like a grandfather, an aunt or uncle, things like that. And then the last section is what I called family relationships, which sounds weird. But <laughs> what it is was there were some families where more than one family member wanted to write the essay. And like, I thought it was wonderful because the first one, for example, the first gentleman, three different people in the family wrote about him, his wife. So that's one perspective. One of his sons, which gives us a second perspective, and a grandchild who is not the daughter of the son that wrote. That's her uncle. So we have three people who wrote there. The second essay is um, written by both the wife and the son, the grown son of a man. And the third essay is, the, or the third section is the one about my husband. And I, of course, I wanted to write about him. And one of his brothers did as well. So it was, you know, if you have that different perspective, because what his brother knows about him, I don't, didn't know my husband when he was growing up. And then in a sense, what I experience as a spouse is not what my brother-in-law would experience either. So what's lovely to me is that um, I've never met some of the people who wrote these essays. I've met lots of them, and, but there's lots I haven't met. And they're even in, uh, one woman is over in Switzerland. Neat. Yeah, and we have like someone in Canada. So, I mean, let, unfortunately, it is a universal problem. You know, people all over the world are familiar with this one. So, and one of the things that I have to say I really like about this book is that um, over 90% of the proceeds are split between four different nonprofits. So, which nonprofits would that be? Oh, sure, put me on the spot. The, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I know the answer. No, no, um, I know the answer. Alzheimer's Orange County, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, the Lewy Body Dementia Association, and the Alzheimer's Foundation and Research Prevention. I think it is. They're in Arizona, and I. It was the first time I had done something like this. You know, you get this idea. It's a great idea. You think, oh, yeah, I think I, think I should do this. And maybe I should tell you why I thought I should do this book. That was my next question. <laughs> You're never going to get to ask one. You just started the first one, and I'll just finish from That's there. That's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. I'll just sit <laughs> here and go, listen. <laughs> go get some coffee. Come back later. Well, so my husband was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment when he was 55 years old. It was completely out of the blue. I had never heard of such a thing in my life. Um, I had just turned 49 the day my husband got lost driving. It was on my birthday, in fact. And our son was only in junior high. And it's interesting when I look back on it, because when I would talk to doctors, when I would send emails about information, that was kind of like how my story began. I would say, he's only 55, I'm only 49, we have a son in junior high. And I realized later, it was almost like I was pleading my case. If I lay these facts out for you, you will understand why this is wrong, why this is not correct. The first email I sent reaching out for help with Alzheimer's Orange County, that I was like, 
but my husband's, you know, 55, I'm 49, our son's in junior high. So obviously this is not the right spot. She'll be like, she that's that like, Jinsey woman. Her husband's 55, she's 49, <laughs> they have a son in junior high. <laughs> and so when they wrote back, they were like, yes, we have classes for you to take. And I thought, well, you're totally wrong because how could this be happening at my age and his age? And, you know, this is just, it, I'd never, ever heard of such a thing. I mean, I hope this isn't offensive, but, you know, Alzheimer's was for old people. That's a like pretty common old thought. People. Like people over 80. I was like generous in my oldness. Oh, 80, older. And at the time of my husband's diagnosis, my parents had passed away. I dodged a bullet. If his parents had a problem, you know, that was going to be his family of three boys, their issue, not, not mine. I'm the daughter-in-law. So, you know, my, I sent my husband to the doctor the first time by himself when he said, I should go and have this checked. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I don't know why. And then he came back with some misinformation about that, you know, that he was supposed to get an MRI. And I figured, well, he must have been dying because we were with an HMO and they never do an MRI two days later. So I sent him, I went with him that time. And the doctor gave us this whole list of, and this was a do, an old school doctor, you know, black bag type of doctor. Oh, dear. <laughs> yes. But he was actually very, very good. And there was this whole list of tests my husband would need. And I thought, huh. This is fascinating. They're wasting so much money. Okay. And he said, you know, I'm not quite sure how quickly some of these will be scheduled, but, you know, um, you know, they will contact you. Well, by the time we got home, and it, it's probably a 30-minute drive from this particular doctor's office, there were already two messages waiting on the home answering machine trying to schedule these next follow-up tests with us. Yikes. He, yeah. So they never move that quick. No. So pretty much between October 16th and the end of November, he had everything done. I put it except a colonoscopy. He had his eyes checked. Oh, yeah, his teeth didn't have to be checked. I think they checked his hearing. Like the colonoscopy <laughs> is not attached. <laughs> no, but it was like everything else. I mean, he had, you know, the pet scan and the cat scan and that weird thing where they put the thing that looks like a shower cap on your head with electrodes coming out of it. I always get them mixed up. And the EKG, I mean, they checked his heart. They checked everything. And I was like, this is nuts. And then we went back to the doctor's office and cause he had said, well, you know, let us know and, or we'll contact you when we have all the results. I was like, Hey, time to come in. And so we sat there and he said, okay, so your husband has a mild cognitive impairment. It may or may not lead to Alzheimer's. Um, if this, is the, this is the pharmacy you want your prescriptions to go to. Okay, great. Well, happy holidays and I'll see you in February. And I thought, I, I'm not really sure what he used, the A word in there. I got that out of it. I'm not really sure what he said. So I remember I felt like I was just in a daze going back out to the nurse's station where she's like, yeah, here, here's all the information. Here's this and this. Merry Christmas. We'll see you in February. And I was like, um, okay. And it's like, this is going to sound funny, but I think you'll understand. I didn't even know enough to ask any questions. I, I didn't know what to ask, where to start. Why would I want to ask these questions? So we still had the th same 30 minute drive home and we drove home probably about, 23, 24 of those minutes before either one of us spoke. Mm. And I said, mild. He used the word mild. Colds are mild. Lots of things in life are mild. We have mild weather. So this isn't going to be a big deal. This is, this is just mild. <laughs> My husband didn't say much. He was doing a lot of sleeping at the time. And I had no idea, not in the car, but like in his life, you know, like he would have to leave work a lot because he just wasn't doing as well. And, Okie dokie, sure, whatever, I don't understand. And so we got home, he went and took a nap, and I promptly went online, tried to Google mild cognitive impairment, got completely overwhelmed because they kept throwing that dementia word in there as well. I didn't know what they were talking about. I mean, it sounds stupid. I feel very ignorant, but on that topic I was. 
And then, like I say, then I saw they had classes on this Alzheimer's Orange County website. And I thought, I can do classes. I am really good at classes. I know how to take a class. <laughs> so I sent off this email and they right away replied and said, all these attachments with lots of information explaining what mild cognitive impairment was. I didn't like that explanation. And with like that umbrella picture, that's what I, that one that says dementia, and it shows all the things under the dementia umbrella. And you're like, mm, I think someone is sadly mistaken. And yeah, it's this not is the me. wrong umbrella. Yeah. I don't know why these people keep telling me the same thing. But I mean, I was convinced they were, they were all wrong, not me. It, it couldn't possibly. There was, I mean, my son was in junior high. Did you catch that part? You know, whoever heard of this happening? And it was like, oh my. So my husband worked for Disneyland at the time. And one of his jobs was working with the rides to make sure that the rides were safe and up to snuff. Well, honestly, you cannot have a person with a cognitive impairment safely doing that. Or even if they can do that, that's really just, you don't want to risk the day they're having a bad day. Yeah, definitely. So he, we instantly like hear from the, from Disney, because we had to tell them what was going on. And they're like, oh, you're put out on disability. And I call the doctor's office. I'm like, but now we have all this paperwork. And I don't know what to do. And, I do, do, do. Ah! and he's like, happens all the time. Don't worry about it. Bring the paperwork in. And I felt like I was taking an encyclopedia. It probably wasn't that bad, but it was just like, here, here's paperwork. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so that was like about a week before Christmas. My husband, this was his dream job, by the way. Aww. And we found out, you know, he had to go on disability. And fortunately, when he had started there, they had talked him into getting like a long-term disability plan that helped cover part of his salary. It wasn't like a long-term, like the rest of his life, but it was while he was employed. So that covered a portion of his salary, which involved, you know, then you get involved with an attorney on the East Coast, even though we're on the West Coast, because they're going to walk you through this because the insurance company doesn't want to pay this big chunk. And so they want you to quickly get Social Security. <laughs> and so the insurance company tells you how to properly fill out the paperwork, and it comes with the caveat, don't worry, you're going to be turned down. Everybody is turned down. And then we reapply, you get accepted, and you get all that money back. And I kept thinking, I don't want that money back. I want my husband to go back to work. This is cool. Still not quite getting it. And uh, so it was shocking because we weren't turned down. Turns out that kind of a diagnosis, you don't really get turned down. When, the doc when you go back and you look at the doctor's paperwork and it says prognosis and it's not good, you go... Oh, so I would kind of like hide the paperwork from my husband. He wasn't interested in it anyway. But yeah, so meanwhile, though, the class that we were going to take started with Alzheimer's Orange County. Okay, I was ready. And I had been pretty cool through all this, except for like one meltdown where I was thinking, how will I ever afford a nursing home for my husband and college for my son at the same time? <laughs> and then I thought, okay, let's back up. This sounds like something my grandmother never said, but a grandmother would say about don't borrow trouble. So I was like, okay. I guess we'd call it today living in the moment. But it was like, okay, just don't go there. So, okay. So I go to this class and there's like four couples. You start out together, the couple and two facilitators. And then it was a multi-week class and then they'd split you up. And so the caregiver side would go with one facilitator and the, the other side would go with another facilitator. And we each had our little notebooks and life is good. And we go around the table and we introduce ourselves. Purple and folders. I, uh -huh. yeah. And I have a huge, just, I just start bawling. And I'm like, wow, that was exciting. I never expected that. You know, That wasn't what I was expecting at all. You know, That's just not normally me. But yeah, I couldn't even get through my introduction oh. without falling apart. So we go to our class. We dutifully go. And then we're about three, four weeks in. And the woman leading the class says, <clears throat> Can you two stay a little bit later? I'd like to talk to you about something. And I thought, oh, she finally gets the point. She has finally realized we are in the wrong spot. Yeah, it took them a while, but it's okay. And she says, um, oh, yeah, I was real good at this, wasn't I? She says to my husband, whose name is Steve, she says, Steve, you're depressed. And I looked at him and I said, you're depressed? And he looked at me and he said, I'm depressed? And we looked at her and said, he's depressed? And she said, <laughs> yes, he's depressed. And you need to take him to the doctor. And I said, oh, my God. Do I stop at the hospital on my way home? Do I go to emergency? What do I do? And she's like, no. 
you, you go home and, and you make an appointment and you take him to his primary care physician who will probably refer him to someone. I'm like, okay, okay, I don't have to go to emergency on my way home, right? No, no, it's okay. I'm like, okay. And at this point, I was like, oh no, this wasn't good at all. That was not what she was supposed to say. <laughs> she was supposed to say, oh, we were wrong. So later though, I mean, again, I'm mean, like, my husband's also standing there. So I don't know how much of this depression conversation I should have in front of him, this man who doesn't know he's depressed, but it would explain why he was napping for four hours a day. Ooh, um, that's a lot. Yeah, that was not, especially because he slept about 12 hours a night. <clears throat> I know, do the math. Yeah, not much left of the day. And uh, so I la later asked her why she said that. And she said, because he has lost his zest for life. And I said, oh, I said, for the last three months, we've been going to the doctor's appointments. And every time we go, I say, my husband has lost the sparkle in his eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, oh, and it's interesting because not one doctor ever asked a question, ever connected. They would say, watch for signs of depression. And I was like, what does that look like? You know, they never told me what it looked like. And I never really knew to ask because I, I guess I should know. And I would think okay, does that mean I take the knives out of the kitchen? I'm not sure what, what watching for a sign of depression is. You know, he's not walking around like trying to kill himself as far as I can tell. I mean, really, I had no clue again. I've gotten very educated since then, but the, it's been 10 years. I hope to have gotten educated. I would have liked to have been educated on something different than this, but that's okay. You know, I've tried to help a lot of people with all of my knowledge over the years. But so it was finally about that time, it was kind of like, oh, this is really real. And okay. So he went to the doctor about this depression. And that was another one of the few appointments I ha did not go to with him. And she sent him home with a prescription and said, he needs to go see a psychologist. So I pull out the insurance paperwork. And I actually just called the insurance company and said, listen, my husband needs to see a psychologist and you need to find one within walking distance. I said, We've had seven appointments this week, and it's only Thursday. Oh, God. <laughs> and I said, I can't. I just don't know if I can keep doing it at this rate. So we found one within walking distance for the first one. And he still drives to this day because he still has mild cognitive impairment, although he doesn't drive to his psychologist's office anymore. I mean, in normal times, pre this, like last year. Um, but, you know, so he would take himself and to, in the beginning, but... It's, yeah, I mean, it's been very, very strange, but I think you asked about why I came up with the book. <laughs> well, because of my husband and because what I was noticing was with these many doctors we would go to, like we went to a different um, neurologist who actually was more educated about mild cognitive impairment when we left than when we entered the room. <laughs> oh, Lord, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I would notice a lot of the people, there was always two of us in the room, me and my husband, and they'd look at me. Well, how's your husband feeling today? He's right there. He can still speak. Would you like to ask him? Oh, oh, okay. And, well, what did he used to do? And I was like, still <laughs> sitting there, still speaks. So... I noticed that not every doctor, I have to say it was, not every doctor, some of them are just, to, that we still have, we'll say, that are still part of the team, are know what he did for a living, talk to him about it, engage him, because he can still do all those things. But so many people we would encounter would be, oh, uh, he has something related. So about your husband, you know? <laughs> and be like, yeah, no, he... Why don't you talk to him? Have a sentence with him. I mean, not that when we normally go to the doctor, anyway, the doctor has a lot of time for chit-chat, but at least we're talking to us. And so that's what made me come up with the idea for this book is because I thought, you know, these people, it wasn't just my husband, but we would be in support groups. And these people were amazing. And I would hear about these lives that they had that, you know, may they might have been 80, so of course they're not doing what they did at 20 or 30, but you know, but they had these lives that were amazing. Like there's a story in here about one woman and she and her husband, we went to one of the, one of the support groups we went to over the years was, um, you know, us you know, couples again. And the same thing, like the first thing we attended where they would split up the couples after you were there initially. So I've I was heard about her. that one in my support group. It sounds really nice. Cause the 
people with the mild cognitive impairment can talk to each other and yes yeah it, that, i think that would have been really beneficial for my mom but my parents played denial not like you oh, did yeah <laughs> you did a much more fun fun way and he got diagnosed really i mean most people it takes a couple of years you got like yes. a couple of months i know it was really fast i was shocked which is probably better yeah because i mean you probably felt like you were run over by a truck oh yeah but yeah. then you could do things early on like get educated and go to yes. support groups yes. and i think it's funny because when i took mom to the doctors they would always talk to her well how are you feeling today fine <laughs> i'd be like uh-uh you know i was like almost like a ventriloquist i'd sit you know and they'd always have their back to me so it's like they'd ask her questions and she'd give them some uh, some answer and i'd be like mm -mm. That, that's that's not reality you know, and i try to be like really subtle like no that's not true looking around the room pretending i'm not talking to anybody in particular <laughs> and and they never talked directly to me the neurologist was good the neurologist would look at my mom and talk and my mom would ramble on but i would also answer so that woman was good because she was listening to both of us she looked yes. like she was ignoring me mm -hmm. she had she was looking at mom and but she was listening to me and i thought she was really good but she was always behind because she always gave people lots of time oh which was oh. great but it was frustrating when you were waiting for her so it's oh, interesting yeah. that you had the opposite i mean my mom was in late stage and they're trying to get information out of her which was just dumb mm -hmm. and your husband still you know can advocate for himself and they're trying to get information out of you that's that's one of my goals is to help the medical profession get smarter yes yes and i mean it some of the things they could do to improve wouldn't be that hard mm -hmm. like when you go who would, who would you like us to address today? You know, they could ask that simple question. The uh, primary care physician my husband has now, he, I really like him, and he pretty much talks directly to my husband, but then it, before the appointment's over, he turns and he looks at me and he goes, and what questions do you have today? Because be he knows I always do. Yeah, so I, don't, I can just wait patiently, and I can interject as things go along, but then I get my turn, too. And I also, this doctor, I will email him throughout, you know, if I have a question, if there's an issue, if there's something I want them to know, I just use their system, send them an email. And they're very good at being responsive. Yeah, I find they like that better, I think. Yeah. That's what I yeah. found with mom's doctors. But I think one of the big things that needs to change besides their understanding, because with me, mm -hmm. it was always like, why do they not get that it's two patients? The physical yes. body of mom and the one person that has the information that you need. Like, you need yeah. me there. You cannot treat her without my presence because you're not going to yes. get any anything from her and that was frustrating. So i'm like so why do you guys not a lot it's like oh she's the gal with the advanced alzheimer's let's we, we need to make that a 15 minute appointment or not five or whatever increment right. they make or, no, and i, I know they get paid there's because i've advocated for this you know i don't know if you've gone to our state advocacy day in february oh I've done you'll that. be surprised to hear my husband has no, I, I was there, one of the guys on my team, um, he's not too far from here. He's probably a little, probably in his 60s, maybe older. He didn't look older, but I vaguely recall somebody mentioning his age and he didn't look at his age at all, but he's living with Alzheimer's and he was there advocating in February at the state capitol, which we're in California, so it's Sacramento for those people who aren't listening or who aren't, don't remember where I live, <laughs> there we go. Um, and one, one of my very first guests is a huge advocate. She has early onset Alzheimer's mm. and I was shocked cause I talked to her in, um, March of 2018. And then I saw her in February of 2019 mm -hmm. and she recognized me and we'd only ah. seen each other once. And I thought, dang. And she's like, I was wearing this shirt that says, says oh, hashtag. Okay all's podcast and she said oh hi she's and, and she i don't know if she remembered my name mm -hmm. which is fine i remembered hers but that was easy i'm really bad with names <laughs> and i was shocked that she remembered me she recognized me she remembered me and you know and details not like 
when I used to photograph weddings, I'd be in the grocery store and be like, oh, crap, that gal looks familiar. Who is that gal? And so you'd like try to avoid them. And then you find out it's the mother of the bride. And it's like, oh, crap. Why, why not? What was her name again? And most of the time it's because they didn't look the same. Oh, yeah. Nobody looks as good as they – nobody in the grocery store looks as good as they do at a wedding. That is true. So, But there were times I'd be like – I would like literally like slink away to another aisle because I can't remember who that is. I don't want to embarrass myself. Oh, so how did you connect with the people that are in the book, especially the ones you've never met? Ah, good question. I'm like, that's probably yeah. another very good story. Let me get it comfortable. <laughs> I know. I, 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 my, growing up, my brothers used to say it was easier to read the book or actually shorter to read the book or watch the movie than hear me tell about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I did was I started out by mentioning, when I got the crazy idea that wouldn't this be a fun book, um, I started to mention it in support groups. Hey, I have an idea for a book. Do you want to give me your essay? And then I reached out to the different support groups and Alzheimer's organizations in our area and said, hey, can you tell your people, of, you know, their caregivers about this idea I've got? And then I put it on Facebook and Twitter. And through all of those, I just would get someone or someone would know someone or, hey, my, my husband had it but, and my aunt also had it. So can her family write about her? And when I started, I was hoping, I was really hoping for 12 essays. Maybe I'll get 12. I hope I get 12. I won't be embarrassed if I only have 12. It'll just be a skinny book, but I'll have 12. And we ended up with three times that number. And in addition to, like I was saying, that there's um, essays where one person is the subject of two or three essays. There's also like two sisters who together, they don't live near each other, so they did it, you know, virtually, but two sisters who live near, who wrote together about their father. So it's, you know, and um, some of the essays are super creative. Like uh, one, she wrote it um, and set it off with titles of Frank Sinatra songs. Hmm. So it's quite beautiful. And uh, some of them are, you know, not written. I mean, most of them are not written by professional authors or writers. And then a few people submitted either their eulogy that they had given or a modified version um once submitted literally the eulogy thank you for coming today and it was like oh, <laughs> okay i was like yeah no problem i can do this and so some required more editing than others and some required the guidance of hey i see you mentioned your brother rob in here do you have rob's permission to bring up his name and the next version rob would be missing <laughs> So that was okay, but that was, um, so I did a lot of editing and changing things. So like, it wasn't as though they were actually speaking their eulogy in this book. I didn't want it to be that. I wanted someone to read about the person, not thank you for coming today. Yeah, that that's, doesn't work. that's a little weird. Yes. But what I would do was I would edit it and then send it back to say, do you approve? Do you not approve? And the people who were the authors were less likely to approve their essays, <laughs> their edited essays, and that's okay. And the people who were not authors were like, oh, sure, I don't care. And a couple people were like, I want to do an essay. I don't know where to start. So I'd say, okay, you know, one was the woman who lived nearby. So I went over to her house back in the old days. And yeah. we sat across the table from each other, not wearing masks. And, you know, I would just ask her questions about her loved one and took notes and then said, I will put something together and I will email it to you to give you a place to start. So, yeah. So on the back of the book, you know, for example, I say it, and this is actually in the introduction as well. It says, you know, this book is a love story and a labor of love. It is an anthology of stories by 36 authors each about a relative they have known and loved before that person was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. First and foremost, these stories are about human beings. They are about moms, dads, attorneys, teachers, sailors, dreamers, doers, and lovers. They are about people like you and me, people with hopes and plans for the future who lived or are still living a life worth remembering. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And then I... Used to be a shy person. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I was high too. School. Yeah, through high school and then I got to college and changed. And so then this really brought me out of my shell because I was um, 
being filmed for a video for Alzheimer's Orange County and found out that the band who was putting the film together, his father had passed away from Alzheimer's. I was like, hey, I'm writing a book. Do you want to contribute an essay? <laughs> it's in here. I will tell you, his essay is in here. Now, what's interesting is there's a lot of celebrities, of course, that you hear about their parent. And it, I have always thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if Maria Shriver or Jane Seymour or not Jane Seymour, or, oh, uh, Joan London, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there. The guy from Will and Grace. Um, what a great way to put it. I'm so sorry. I don't, oh, Sean Hayes. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and I'd like an essay from you. But uh, <laughs> if any of them would contribute an essay to the book, that would be, you know, pretty cool as well. Because it have it's in. It doesn't matter. It's all people in all walks of life. It doesn't matter if your family is barely getting by, or if your family is a multimillionaire and a celebrity that we all know their name. You know, like Sandra Day O'Connor has Alzheimer's. Oh yes, she does. Yes, in fact, um, I've learned more about her because that's my son goes to that law school. In fact. Oh, cool. And there was yes. another Supreme Court justice whose husband had Alzheimer's, though, so she stepped down, I think. No, I it's same one. Actually, Sandra Day O'Connor's husband had Alzheimer's. And now so she does. She stepped down. And that, yes, that's why she left the bench. And wow. she stepped down. And I did contact her organization. And they said she really can't do anything like that that's raising money for something. And then a couple of years later, yes, they announced she had it. And then she's kind of stepped back into a more private life. Which makes sense. And were yeah, you an sense. author before? Um, I was a, just a co-author with four other people in some caregiving book tips books that we'll talk about another time. But um, yeah, that's it. And before that, nope. Just kind of <laughs> like, oh, I think I'll just do this. And yeah. Well, like I thought, oh, I don't find a podcast on Alzheimer's caregiving that I like. I'll just start my own. <laughs> See, there you go. I often think it's sort of like we used to hear about the Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, you know, let's put on a show kind of movies. Kind of like that. Let's write a book. <laughs> because why not, right? I mean, Might as well do something positive. Yeah, and, and I did, you know, we ended up using um, the self-publishing platform lulu.com to publish the book. And I'm very happy with it. My friend uh, Trish helped me. She did all the the, the Lulu side of it, so I didn't even have to worry about it. But I did contact a few publishers, and some people were interested, you know, some of the small publishing houses. But it came to the point where the people who were still alive, who were written about in the book, were starting to pass away from Alzheimer's. And there is a man who wrote an essay about his wife. And I knew this couple. And he was around 90, and I wanted the book published before he died. That... I just really wanted it done before he died. And I was afraid if I went with a publisher, you know, a, a regular, you know, more conventional publisher, it wasn't going to happen in the time I needed it to. So we did it this way. And yes, it was published before he died. It wasn't that he was sick. It was just that he was older. And it was probably <laughs> out for a year before he passed away. But I really just, I wanted that for him, you know. So, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm happy with it, you know. Um, yeah, I'm very, I was very happy with the process, very happy with, you know, every bit of frustration I may have encountered was 100% worth it for the day I could say, we have a book, and here it is. And it's funny because my husband was reading his essay, <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the things when someone edits the essays, and uh, somebody did edit mine as well. But if you told me you were 35 in your essay, I don't know your age, so I would assume it's fine, right? I would just believe it. <clears throat> I put the wrong year for my husband's diagnosis. Oh, whoops. <laughs> and my husband caught it, and thankfully, it was just like in kind of the pre, the first, the first, like the preview copy of the book, and I had to call my friend and say, I messed up. <laughs> yes, I messed up. And then, of course, then you're like, then you get to be picky. Well, as long as we're changing that, let's change this or that. That. you know it's, cascading, it's exciting cascading edits <laughs> yes yes I mean just it was interesting just thinking about like how how to lay it out Cho's essay is amazing by the way this is the first I opened the book with it she wrote such an amazing essay about her father and so I mean so with each essay it's laid out that has the title and has who wrote it and then just a short piece about the subject of the essay 
and they could write a sentence or a short paragraph about the person. And then at the end of the essay, and they, you know, people say, well, how long an essay do you want? It's kind of like, you know, the first book I did set um, a, a word count, but some of the essays needed more words, and so they have them. And at the end, the author could tell about themselves. Mm. So I give a chance for each person to do that. In the beginning, you know, we have a table of contents, and then in the back, we have um, we have an index by author. Oh, that's helpful because, too. Yeah, and because people are going to buy the book because you put a story in it, so they want to see your story, Jennifer. They want to skip the others. They don't necessarily they don't know what you called your essay. So, but if they can just go to the back and go, oh, look, Jennifer Fink, oh, look, there's her essay. And a couple people did not want their last name used, they, so we didn't. You know, it's very simple. Their, their last name is not in here, and that's okay with, that's how they wanted it. Um, a couple people, you know, I, the spin on their essay uh, was kind of, there was one in particular where the person was really negative about the family and how they hadn't helped. It was really vocal in their essay about that, and I finally went, can we do this with it instead? I really, I would kind of put it that we really want to shine a light on your mother and what your mother was like. We don't even want to give these other people the time of day. That probably helped resonate with changing the direction. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't even need to acknowledge those people, you know, why, why do that? And that did help, you know? Yeah. There were a couple, like one person was like, well, I don't know anything about my father. And I was like, well, did he do this? Did he do that? What, and then it was like, oh, 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 okay. I see what you want to do. And But there were people yeah, who said, yeah, I want to do it, but I don't even know where to start. And I thought, I totally relate. You know, because even with my husband, it was like, at that point, we'd been married 20 years. Um, pick something. Just, but, but it can only be this long, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but you can't tell the whole 20 years. So you kind of were saying, hey, this is who they are. This is, this is what, what's hidden from me now sometimes. But this is the part, you know, that you want people to know. Well, that brings me up. So we're going to pivot a little bit. So we're recording guess. this during the shelter in place mandates, the stay home mandates, whatever we want to call it. How is yes, Steve yeah. handling that? Um, for the most part, good. Probably decent like the rest of us or decently like the rest of us. He, he you know, I have to say, you know, um, after he was diagnosed, he decided, well, that had taken part of his brain, and so he needed to work out the other part of the, his brain. And like I say, he still drives now, but he decided to start taking some community college classes. So he's taken, like, art, um, painting, sculpting, and welding. But the class he's in right now is woodworking which is cool. He made a table he, last semester and he made a picture frame and he made something else equally nice. Oh, a cutting board that I don't use. Um, <laughs> woodworking. Have you ever tried to do woodworking on a computer um, Zoom from your home? No. My mom don't. did wood wor wood blah, 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 woodworking yeah. and... It should have been a bigger clue. I mean, we'd knew, known for years that she had a problem. Like I said, they were she was good on denial. And there was some big excuse about why she couldn't go back. It was uh, expensive. There was something about the instructor not being helpful, which she probably thought he wasn't being helpful, but it was probably because it didn't stick. Mm -hmm. So, But she made um, like little flat birdhouse decorations oh, wow. that they sold through her Seroptimus group. Oh, that's it was, neat. It was like something she made for the, like as a fundraiser. I have a little uh, trivet, so like a uh -huh. wooden hot plate thingy, hot, you know, for putting hot right, stuff yeah. on. Um, she made a wine bottle holder, wine rack. For my niece, this was, let's see, my niece is 14 and a half. Oh, so okay. She was probably two-ish close to two my mom made this beautiful rocking horse oh for wow for christmas um yeah i feel bad for my niece and my nephew because my daughter's 28 so my my mm. daughter got all the good years of grandma yeah and then when my daughter was you know snotty teenager grandma was starting to become really kind of a pain in the rump and the other little <laughs> other 
the my niece was around so the niece got a lot of the attention so that all worked out kind of timing wise but my nephew came into the family he's adopted so he didn't get any of the good years with mom so oh, that's that's, that's really bad. sad yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean i yeah. get that's my when the sad feelings come over my it's not sad that she's gone it's sad that I, I just, I keep saying, oh, poor mama, which I never called her mama, but whatever. You know, it's like what should have been. And like this morning, my mom, or my mom, ugh, guess who's on my head? My husband was saying, he, as we're riding our bikes, he's like, you know, I'm thinking about what it would have been like if mom didn't get Alzheimer's. Because she's only 77. Mm. She turned 77. Oh, she was January. young. Yeah. Yeah. She was like 77 years and like two and a half months. So, like, mm. seriously, not very old, especially no. compared to my grandmother, who's 102. Yeah. Which every time I say that, I just, ugh, I get a little bit tired. <laughs> so, yeah, my mom did woodworking. My mom was super creative. So, you know, I tried to engage her on creative stuff, but because I, I started too late, my, I, unfortunately, my education, I learned a lot, but I didn't learn it soon enough for uh -huh. the best of her benefits. But I've talked to people who, like I've got a friend, she's also a past guest, whose dad is 93. He has Lewy body dementia. Uh -huh. And he's really struggling. I mean, mm. a couple days ago, he hadn't eaten, he hadn't drank anything all day. He hadn't urinated all day. Oh, which is definitely my. not good. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, it's mid-April. I'm like, could you get some, it's like, are watermelons available? <laughs> like, Feed him watermelon because it's super, I mean, it's watermelon. Right, right. <laughs> and she said, well, I got a cup and a half of it in him this morning. I'm like, that's good. Yeah, to um, start, wow. That's a lot of liquid and it's it a is. lot of fiber. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but she thinks he's depressed and he goes to an adult day program here in town and so does another support group member. And I said, you know what? My grandfather always said, you're not going to get out of this life alive. I said, why don't you guys just meet at the church where the social, you know, the day program is just sit on different benches and just talk, just, yeah. you know, give him some other face to look at, you know, give you a little different break. And she's contemplating that. Cause I said, you know, if we're protecting them from getting this virus, but they decline much more rapidly are we really doing them a favor i mean this is a really right. that's a really horrible question to have to be contemplating and i'm glad oh, i don't is. have to it's contemplate like, it yeah but he's yeah. he's doing good with online classes that's awesome and how long has it yeah. been since the diagnosis uh it was 10 years in december okay um, but it's funny because they can't really do the woodworking online but yeah. every it's a two day a week class so every monday wednesday though the instructor bless his heart does a zoom lecture and shows them stuff in his workshop or a video of something, how he was trying to make it. So even though they can't be making it, it's really nice because my husband is still going and participating. And then many days it wipes him out and it's a three hour nap after it. I was like, oh, you know, I don't want to complain. It's not like he has something else to be doing. Yeah. But then I did hear a report the other day on NPR and it said, are you finding yourself more tired after all these zoom calls? And it's because like the heads are bigger and you can't, <laughs> You only see this much of the body language to read, not all of it. And, you know, so it does take for all of us, actually, a lot more brain power to process what we're seeing and doing now using Zoom or whatever technology it is to <laughs> FaceTime, one of the, whatever these things are. That's yeah. interesting. I hadn't seen that, but that is, I see, I just find the brain is so fascinating. Oh, I know. I know. I'm, I am amazed and impressed that doctors can actually diagnose these different types of dementia because everybody's brain is so different. And it's like, you know, if you take two people, even from the same family, but their experiences growing up were so different that they're going to show, you know, they're going to, they interpreted things differently that they both saw. It's like two people being at the scene of the crime and their stories are so different. And, you know, I mean, it's like, how do you figure something out when people's brains are that different? I always figure, you know, they say like, they think, you know, sounds like Star Trek, but you know, they think, oh, space is our last frontier. You know, like the Wild West used to be the last frontier. No, oh, yeah. no, no. I think they know more about space than they do about our brains. I think so. I do think so. So yeah. I think the brain is the last frontier. So I hope, you know, if I live to be 102, like my grandmother, 
Mm, that's that's 49 more years. Lord. <laughs> Again, there's that tired feeling. <laughs> yeah. This has been fantastic. It has. And now, Jennifer, you are going to contribute a story to the volume two of this, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yes. And if anyone else wants to, just let us know and we'll, you know, give them information. But yeah, that'll be great. I'm going to look forward to your story and what angle you take and what period of your mom's life you pick. Take your time. We're not in any rush. Yeah, I'm like, I got to think about that one. <laughs> There's a lot of, I mean, well, we, I've got 53-ish years to sift through. <laughs> So. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, you guys stay well. Thank you so much. You do the same. And thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.